Yes, thank you, Father, for this evening. Thank you that we have possibility again to come with the family, with the family of God, together, gathered in Jesus' name. And we know that our Lord is in the midst of us, even though we are situated and located in many different even cities, places. But in the spirit, we, we are connected because the same spirit abides with us. And thank you, Father, that you speak to us this evening through your word, showing forth what we need to do, that your light, that your glory changes us from glory to glory, so that people will enter from darkness into your son's kingdom. Thank you, Father, that you speak through different ways. We are all open to you, and we give all the glory to you, because it is not any of us. It is our Lord working through us. Thank you, Father, that you work this evening, and you get all the glory. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Great is the mystery of godliness. And great is the mystery of godliness. For God to become flesh. For God to be justified in the spirit. For God to be seen of the angels. For God to be preached to the Gentiles. For God to be believed on in the world. For God to be received into glory. And great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery mystery of godliness and great is the mystery of godliness for god to become flesh for god to be justified in the spirit for god to be seen of the angels for god to be preached to the gentiles for god to be believed on in the world for god to be received into glory and grace is the mystery of godliness for the last time great is the mystery of godliness oh and great is the mystery of godliness for god to become flesh oh for god to be justified in the spirit for god to be seen of the angels for god to be preached to the gentiles for god to be believed on in the world for god to be received into glory and great is the mystery of godliness amen this song is from first timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and there the bible wrote Paul the apostle was writing to timothy and was writing to the church and paul said and without controversy great is the mystery of godliness how do we understand that it means this matter is a controversial matter it is at the same time a great matter it is at the same time a mystery so that makes it very complex a controversial great and mysterious issue and if that is the case what then is the matter and paul proceeded by listing six things that are controversial as are 2000 years ago they are still controversial today 2000 years after they were great 2000 years ago they are still great 2000 years after they were mysterious 2000 years ago they are still mysterious 2000 years after but the holy ghost can demystify the mystery the holy ghost can bring us into its greatness the holy ghost can take away the mist of controversy from that from that scripture first timothy chapter 3 verse 16 in fact we were made to understand that this actually summarizes the whole bible if somebody tells you what's the summary of the bible is first timothy chapter 3 verse 16 if somebody says show me a verse that can encapsulate what is in genesis up to revelation it is first timothy chapter 3 verse 16 not genesis chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning god created the word and so what right but there was something that went wrong there was something all of the scripture is about god in a mechanic workshop trying to figure out what went wrong and how to fix this car, Adam and Eve. Is that not true? All through the Old Testament, it was a fixation of the broken down equipment. The equipment was God communicating with man, literally. Man hosting God. That 
was what God created at the beginning that was perfect. So much that God can visit man in the cool of the evening. But Satan came and destroyed that 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 beautiful that beautiful setup, right? And God, who created man in His own image, suddenly became lonely. Where is man? When he came to the Garden of Eden, Adam, where are you, right? <laughs> It has become broken. The communication line has been severed. And God sent the prophets. God sent the kings. God sent the judges. How can I? In fact, God had to recruit a nation and produce a nation and say, this one will be my people. But they still went to idol. That's Israel. That's the whole of Genesis. That's the whole of Exodus. That was what he was trying to do. God was trying to fix the broken line of communication between us and himself. And then he tried up to the book of Malachi. It looks as if it was so tedious to fix. Men cannot fix men. Even though men saw God face to face. They saw the glory of God like Moses was in the mount. Joshua. Samuel, God said, I will speak to him face to face. You know, all of the prophets, they saw the glory of God. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, as I, Isaiah, I saw the Lord, right, in his glory. And his train filled the temple and he fell. And God said, who shall I send? He said, I will go, right? God kept on sending mechanics, human mechanics, to try to fix this broken down communication between us and himself. And that summarized the old book of Old Testament, 39 books. And and then he came to the New Testament and he introduced us with John the Baptist, who comes to introduce God himself. Okay, there's no need to try to fix the mechanics, the workshop. There's no need to try to fix the broken down car by somebody else who didn't produce the car. Is that not correct? There is no need to say, well, since you went to school, I think you have intelligence so that you can be able to fix this Mercedes car. Since you are not the manufacturer of the Mercedes car, it is natural to think that there are things that Mercedes has in the car that you cannot fix. Even though you have the basic knowledge of fixing every car, you need to be in the manufacturer's mind to know why this has to be here. Is that not correct? So God has seen Abraham could not fix, Noah could not fix, Moses could not fix, the broken down system, Isaiah could not fix, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all of them could not fix the broken down system, Elijah, Elisha. And so he decided to come himself. And he came from the manufacturer. God became flesh. That is the mystery. Is that not true? God became flesh. The, the manufacturer of the car visited your house and said, don't you know I am the owner of the car? You say, well, if you are the owner, then take care of it. God descended from heaven. John the Baptist introduced the manufacturer and everything he came to do was to restore us back to factory setting. That is that is the meaning. He came to restore us to factory setting. He is the only one that knows where the reset button is. <laughs> And so he came, thank God for the Holy Ghost. And so when he came, God from heaven, the created man, became flesh. He became flesh and he dwelt amongst us. And the disciples said, we beheld his glory as of the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. And those were the implements by which he was repairing the communication system that was severe between God and man in the Garden of Eden. Truth and grace by the instrumentality of the working of the Spirit of God. God, that was brooding over the surface of the deep in Genesis chapter 1. That was why that was what Paul was summarizing here. That great is the mystery of godliness. God became flesh. It is mysterious. It is great and it is controversial. Do you know many people believe a part of this story but not all? For example, he needed to die to complete the fixing of this engine. He needed to shed his blood to be able to permanently seal the communication line so that we can have access to the throne of grace with boldness and ask for help at the time of need. His blood need to prepare that way for us so that when we die that number, thou heavenly father God says, I see you by the blood. Is that not true? <laughs> It's just as if you want to die an international number and then you quote the number, but you refuse to put the country code. You say, I don't care. Well, your number will not go. <laughs> you need the plus whatever, plus one, plus two, plus four, nine, right? You need plus four, four if you're in the UK. You need those country codes in addition to your private number to be able to ring across border. Earth and heaven is not on the same frame. That is a border. <laughs> For you to be able to dial the heavenly number, there must be a heavenly code. That is the blood. That is the blood of Jesus. It needed to be shared. And that was when, he, when after he has emptied himself of everything, he said it is finished. And the Holy Ghost took that blood and took it 
to heaven and offered it before the father. And the father said, the communication line is fixed. Everything is fixed. Proud to that, when that Jesus came and he was born, when God became flesh, the angel left all their duties in heaven and they came to earth and hung in the sky and they were singing. All the angels, all of them, they were singing and worshipping. Why? Because they said they saw God for the first time. Here the mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 tells us. He said God was seen of the angels. That's pillar number three. Pillar number two, God was justified in the spirit. And then all of these things was preached to the Gentiles. And that's where we are being. And this scripture is what we have been studying for two years now and we have not finished it we are still in the middle god was preached to the gentiles understanding why god came to this world why jesus had to come and fix this severed communication line how jesus needed to share this precious blood to become the heavenly code that we can die to enter into the into the throne of grace and ask for help at the time of need all of these were made, were provided in this scripture as a mysterious thing. Do you know the major religion that runs parallel to Christianity is Islam? And Islam do believe, well, one prophet Jesus came, but actually he didn't die. Ah, if that is so, that means we do not have access to the Father. If his blood was not shed, we don't have the country code. We can't dial his number. And that's the reason they can't dial his number. So I was, we were preaching some days ago, and one of them from a different country was was speaking and he was saying well if i if i miss it eventually i think god is merciful he should he should show me mercy <laughs> that means they are not sure that means they are trying to play with him with logic deductive logic and inductive logic and figuring it out i will try my best if it doesn't work i can i can launch into the commonwealth of the mercies of god he shouldn't throw me to hell he should understand i'm also a man i'm frail well that means you didn't understand the project altogether is that not true the country code has been given. The blood has been shed. And if we don't believe on him, we can't have access. If we don't accept Jesus as the son of God who came and died on the cross to bring, bring God's access into glory. The ultimatum is glory. That is why he was received up into glory. The Bible says that he might become the firstborn among the brethren. That he might turn many sons into glory. That's our destination. He came to fix the communication online so that we all together may be able to have access to sit with him in glory. And do you know that is even literal? As soon as we believe Jesus and accept him into our spirit and we become born again, we receive a new spirit. Is that not true? And the Bible says we are seated in heavenly place. Not that he promised us it's a place to sit. No, he said we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus far above principalities and power. That means that makes us understand that the project about Christ is very expensive and is very quality. It translates us out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is what we need to preach to the Gentiles. If we do not understand why Jesus came, we've got nothing to say. It is not our experience that we preach. It is not our theological ability or the knowledge that we have gotten. No, it is understanding by the Spirit that we reveal to people. Because Jesus said, the word I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And God wants to make all of us ambassador of spirit and life. An ambassador of the message of salvation that can transform from darkness to eternal life. And so all of these weeks, we have been studying just this one verse of scriptures. And the Holy Spirit has been breaking it down for us. And so we have been moving from one pillar to the other. And today, we are currently in the pillar of being preached to the Gentiles, this mystery of godliness, being preached to the Gentiles. Having understood the first pillar, God became flesh. The second pillar, God was justified in the spirit. The third one being, God was seen of the angels. And that is divine. And here is the human aspect. All of those need to be preached to the Gentiles. Not to preach to satisfy the hearings of the Gentiles, but to preach in such a manner that pillar number five will be evidence so that the Gentiles can believe the gospel so that the gentiles can believe the word of god so that the gentiles can believe the scriptures because when they believe it then we can all roll into heaven on a glory line is that not wonderful that is the aircraft glory line <laughs> glory airways 
entering into heaven. Why? Because the gospel that changes life has been brought to us. And we that were sometimes afar off have been brought nigh. The middle wall of partition between us and God have been broken through Christ who died on the cross. We receive the gospel. We believe the gospel. And our night has turned into day. So this period we're looking at how we can learn the skill of presenting his gospel to the Gentiles. What are the things we need to know how to do? How to say? What understanding do we need to have? How should we start preaching the gospel? Why should we need to preach the gospel? Is it necessary? Is there a reward for it? What are the things we are likely to encounter when we preach the gospel? What are the powers we are supposed to challenge when the gospel is preached? What are the results we are expected to have? What confrontation can the gospel bring? What contradiction can result from preaching the gospel? And how do we navigate through all of this? That's what we have been studying so far. And so before we go to a scripture to Day where we take an example of someone preaching the gospel, we like to have a recap of the things that the Holy Spirit taught us um, two weeks ago. So, Akoswa, should we start with you? Last week, um, sorry, last two weeks when the Holy Spirit opened up to us that how to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and we used Acts chapter 13 as an example about Paul preaching in the synagogue, and Paul, you, that scripture verse and the verses was used to open our eyes on how to do it. And one of the key things was to understand your your people, the people, your the people that you are preaching onto, to understand who they are and, and their level of understanding is, for example, the Jews, they were at the synagogue, they were reading the laws and the prophets. But and so Paul, based on that, Paul was able to use that information and to be able and by the power of the Holy Spirit to open their eyes. And we learned so much and how he used history to combine their history, their prophet, their laws, to combine it with John, John the Baptist, to combine it with Jesus. And yeah, so yeah. Yeah, so that is true. Paul the Apostle was preaching in Acts chapter 13 and he was preaching in the synagogue. And this time around, he needed to preach the gospel to people who are actually worshipping God. Is that not a contradiction, right? They are supposed to be worshipping God. Paul is supposed to presume that they were saved. And so maybe he's supposed to encourage the brethren. Hmm. But Paul didn't give that assumption. Paul recognized that the gospel cannot be preached only with the Old Testament because it is a shadow for telling the substance. The substance is a person. Jesus Christ. Everything spoken about the person in the Old Testament is a shadow of things to come. And in presenting the gospel, we need to match the shadow with the substance. And that's why Judaism cannot say. He speaks so much about God the Father. He talks about what Moses said. A prophet like unto me shall God raise up. When he comes, you should listen to him. They talk about David. But David had seen corruption. He had been buried. Yet, Paul the Apostle pulled something out of David. He said God left him a sure message. Israel like listening to that. But they don't understand what the sure message of David actually is. They do think because Solomon sinned and yet God kept two tribes for David because of his promise. So they assume that a king will always come out of the family line of David. But it's actually referring to the king of kings. He said out of, out of that tribe, the tribe of Judah, out of that tribe, Shiloh came. A king came. It's the sure message. And he talked about Paul was telling these people that it is that Jesus that God brought as a manufacturer to fix the broken line of communication between us and God. And while he was speaking, the religious man men in the synagogue were angry. Why do you move out of the Old Testament? Why do you try to step your leg in the New Testament? We crucified him. <laughs> we don't like that guy. We know his father is Joseph. And he came to claim that he is God from heaven. And so we stoned him. So please, don't talk about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let us speak in the context of the Old Testament. Salvation can never be arrived at only in the Old Testament without tying it up to the Jesus in the New Testament. Do we remember when Philip was told to join the chariot of a man that was only reading the book of Isaiah, the Ethiopia eunuch on his chariot. And the man was reading, he was 
was led as a sheep to the slaughter, right? He opened not his mouth. And Philip said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And the man said, How can I understand? Except a man is able to give me some understanding. He said, Who is this prophet talking about? What scenario is, the, is being described here? And the Bible says, Then Philip opened his mouth and preached unto him, Who is he? He didn't preach unto him, Isaiah. No, it was a shadow of a substance to come. And the message was so clear that when they got to the water to a riverside, as they were passing, the guy, Ethiopia eunuch, said, This is water. What doth in that mean to be baptized? Which means as Philip was preaching, the manufacturer was fixing the communication line because the guy was listening with a believing ear. And Philip said, If only you believe. And the man said, Yes, I believe. And they plunged into the water for baptism. And as they were coming out, the Holy Ghost raptured Philip away. Why? Because the job was completed. That man was now sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? He came from the shadows to the substance and he received the joy of the Spirit of God. And a civilization of revival was brought about by that Ethiopia, you know. That's why the substance must be connected to the shadow, which is the Old Testament. Johanny, you can add to that. Yeah, learned how when Holy Spirit taught us how, just like Agosua said, that he connects those laws and prophets, how they were speaking about and reading to and proceeded to Jesus. And he pointed out from the scripture how uh, the, the man of God before whom God was well pleased with David, that this man cor saw corruption, but this whom he's now preaching to them, this Jesus, God raised him from the dead. He did, in, he did not see corruption. And everyone who believes in him can truly be justified from all things that could not be justified by the law of Moses. So they were still looking at David, looking at Moses, just as old people, but they couldn't, they weren't connected still. They didn't have a lighter connection. And only way for that was Jesus. Jesus, and he introduced him to them. Yes. Thank you very much. So it's very interesting that today we still have the same challenge, that people are in churches and yet they don't know Jesus. It is still real. It is still a fact. People are in churches today. They go for the rituals. Now this is Christmas season. There will be so many churches opening their doors for religiosity. People coming and then showing, oh, we was born by a virgin. In fact, they will act drama, right? They will show Jesus and Mary carrying one tiny creature. Mm -hmm. Well, that is all about it. The power of the manufacturer to come and liberate completely from the hand of sin. It's not evident. Why? Because the gospel has not been preached in its nature. The gospel has not been preached in its essence. And if it's not preached in that capacity, we should not expect the power of life transformation. And today, in our generation, we need the gospel to be preached to sinners. We also need the gospel to be preached in the church. To people who are practically occupying pulpits, including priests and pastors and bishops. Why? Because they've not experienced the power of the gospel. And that's why many people are spilling out different kinds of religion Religiosity, different kind of religious statements, different kinds of abominable words. Why? Because they themselves are not free from sin. For example, we are aware that one of the largest denominations in court of Christianity, which is the Catholic Church, headed by the Pope, recently announced that the church, the Catholic Church, can now officially marry gays together. What do you think is the problem? Great is the mystery of godliness, not mystery of iniquity. That rule, that legislation is a mystery of iniquity from the house of God. It is a mystery of iniquity. Why? Because it defiles the cross. Because it's a slap on the manufacturer who came from heaven to fix the communication line that had been severed by Adam and Eve. God wants to host us. He wants us, us to host him and, and on holy atmosphere cannot host God. Such kind of legislation will never allow God to enter into the temple. People will be there, but God will not be there. Do we understand? And so, we are compelled within us to break into such cycles and reveal to them the mystery of godliness. It will make us controversial. It will make people to speak against us. It will make people to misunderstand us. They will call us names and they will say a lot of things. Why? 
Why? Because men love darkness more than light. But does that mean we need to keep quiet? No. We are saddled with the responsibility to declare the whole counsel of God if by any means we can save some. So we preach to the sinners outside. We preach to the Buddhists. We preach to the Muslims. We preach to the atheists. We also preach to Christian religious groups. We preach to the cult groups, the Mormons, the Church of Letter Day Saints. We preach to the Jehovah's Witnesses because they are witnessing something they don't even have an experience of. We preach, we preach to the Gentiles so that they can understand and glory can enter into them because Christ in us the hope of glory. That's what Paul was doing here. In Acts chapter 13, he was proving to the people in the synagogue that there is a Christ different from this religion. And they were not happy. They were mad. The Jews were offended. The Jews decided to begin to split the multitude. They began to raise an uproar. But where? The Bible says, Paul the apostle continued and preached to a point that some Gentiles actually believed. And that was Antioch. But the interesting thing is that Christ believers were first called Christians were in Antioch. It doesn't matter the persecution. Stay and declare the whole counsel of God. It will work. It's just a matter of time. The opposition will be there. That's why Paul said, great is the mystery of godliness. The opposition will be there. The contradiction will be there. Men will rise up and speak against this truth. Do not worry. Keep on speaking. For some will still be saved. So today, we we'll look at Acts chapter 14. And we'll look at a story of how Paul the Apostle proceeded from what happened in chapter 13. And so, let's read Acts chapter 14 and let's read from verse 1 to verse 7. Acts chapter 14 verse 1 to 7. Akosua, can you help us read 1 to 3 and then Johanne uh, us read 4 to 7. Chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, I read, Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against their brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly of, for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. The knowledge of the city was divided and part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and now of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and there the cities of Lysaonia Lysa, and under the region that lied round about. And there they preached the gospel. Thank you very much. Do you see the controversy? The gospel begin to stir when the gospel is unleashed. Why would the gospel raise a lot of controversy? Because the gospel is the only ticket. The gospel is the only ticket for the only truth to the only way to the only life. The only ticket. And Satan knows it. That whosoever receives this gospel will lose the path to hell and gain the path to God. Whosoever loses the path to hell will become an ambassador of that gospel and can wreak havoc in the kingdom of darkness. And so Satan does not want one more opposition, right? For that reason, he resists with all of his power using men, institutions, authority, civilization to resist the gospel, to pull the gospel away from human reasoning. Pull the gospel away from the school. We don't pray again in the school. We remove the gospel from everything. We say, well, we're in a secular world. We want to accommodate everybody. Mm. Those are the workings of Satan at the background. Because he knows the tremendous power he errant in the gospel. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 1, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto what? Salvation. To the Jews first and also to the Greek. Who is afraid of power? We have a lighting system now because there is power sustaining that. If the power is withdrawn, the bulb or the fluorescent lamp is still in your room, but it cannot shine by itself. It needs to depend on the feedback. It needs to depend on the voltage. Is that not correct? The gospel is like that. We can remove its source. When that is done, what we have is lecture. What we have cannot bring salvation. That's what we see in the school of theology. The letter killers, but the spirit gives life. Whenever the word of God is preached, 
quenched him, not of his power. Satan will raise a tremendous contradiction. So much that he splits the congregation into two halves, as we see. Some will believe what is being said, and some will fight it. Nevertheless, we need to keep on preaching because you only you can speak of. Mm -hmm. Just like here in that um, Iconium, it was a city where there were Jews, synagogue of Jews, but there were also many Gentiles who, those people who don't believe in anything or believe in some other God. So this represents same same way this places where we are located. There are churches who say that they know God and worship Him, and they are those other people who don't believe in anything or atheist or whatever they believe in. And our experience and in many parts has been that when we go to the synagogues and preach the gospel, actually the believers are stirred up. I'm from a background that most, almost all will profess, I have many cousins, profess to be saved. But when God changed my life and I started to tell them about the life, of the, how life is transformed by the power of God, how scripture is alive, how we, how, how you love read scripture, how prayer is so magnificent and mighty, you want to dwell in it, spend time with the Holy Spirit, the people were stirred up. The same people who profess that they know God, who, who say that he is their Lord, ruler, now started to contradict those things that were said and glorifying the, the, the ruler they say that is ruling them. And specifically, and in, even those times, when just like in verse 3, it was that say that they speak boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony under the word of his grace. So when we speak the gospel, it's not that we um, we ourselves approve the gospel of what we say, but God is approving and showing by power that is, this is true gospel because the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink. It is joy, righteousness, peace and holy God. It's not in enticing words of human wisdom. It's the power, showing of power and the spirit. So when the real gospel is there, there is power evident. Lives are being transformed. And when, this is the point, when I preach to them with power boldly, with power that had changed my life, had changed and changed us, they were stirred up because they knew they love life didn't haven't changed and when i said an example that i left a denomination i did before a church i before was because when i was mm, preaching the gospel when i was testifying for they were contradicting also there. and when i said that the pastor they asked a meeting with me and when i quickly replied that oh, well it's possible after i had left there but then i started to think that what what actually happened he the pastor actually didn't contact me straight away even though he had my money but contacted me my wife and through that my wife asked me to come there and i was like started after what what is actually happened why did he contact me he has, he has never contacted me or wife through that and then i started to say that actually this is some weird thing and it was at the specific time it took two weeks or one week time that i noticed the difference noticed that thing after my salvation i have been sick only a couple times and i think those times are mostly that i missed it somewhere and this was the another time i missed it because i straight away said that yeah i will come by the way i was sick at that time then i uh, i was guided to, hey i need to change adjust this thing i didn't do it straight away i couldn't be sick but when i said hey actually yes this is wrong i i repent I, I align myself according to the word of God. I informed the past. And in that moment, actually, when I repented, I made the decision. I was healed from the decay. Isn't that instant? I told the pastor, by the way, that God, I cannot come. God guided me this way. And by the way, I have this sickness for this time. When I obeyed the Lord, I was healed in an instant. Do you know what that ruler, that so-called pastor, shepherd of Christ answered? With, I sent him a message in WhatsApp. That pastor sent emoji with crying face. Doesn't sound very loving that God is doing his work. God is, the hand of miracle. And the pastor says, oh, no, how can you do now, and when I testified with the same thing to those cousins I have sh who should have been saved, some people answered angrily, what are you meaning? Do you mean that if you don't beg obey God that you will be sick? And, and there was like this kind of fuss and like rage coming up. I was, I just pulled my uh, say away from that. But this is the, not just in far history, but even today. Just the same time when we were speaking to, uh, not Buddhist man, but the Islam man, we met also a woman who professed to and actually was part of the biggest denomination in this country. When we started to share the gospel to woman, the woman started to tell, but well, you can, it's pretty, it's, you are, if you confess in that way that you are actually saved, you are proud. And I always said, like, what are you saying? Don't you know that the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, yes. and the alleged uh, hope spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God. Actually, then the woman was quiet, but still contradicting this and this and this and saying, it's the Jews, the people who haven't experienced the 
about they have gone all their life to synagogue with just professing rituals and things. And because they are so near but still so far, because their heart is callous, their heart is far, far removed from God, they don't want their heart to be changed by the power of God. That's why when power is introduced, power is shown that it says that you can experience the power. They all are offended. But don't you mean that we are saved already? Don't you mean that we have experienced it? At the same time, they are living in sin that they are not enjoying the presence of God. So this was Paul's experience. It's the very same today because the gospel is same today and the power to prove it is same today. That's why we preach. Because if the power has changed your life, you expect the power to change somebody else's life. And it is true. It does change lives. And when you preach a true gospel, God is under obligation to prove that the gospel still works. We don't do the proving. The Holy Ghost does the proving. If truly what we are saying is the truth, it will cut people's hearts, change lives. It will restore backsliders. It will reinvigorate those who are spiritually weak and revive their hearts and cause them to enter into a life of blazing fire. And God will be glorified. The evidence of the preached gospel. That is why we preach. Because it works. And we are going to share a few things. If the Holy Ghost permit. Hakoswa, give us some thoughts from this passage. Or what is coming to your mind. Or any questions you have. Nothing much. But I'm just thinking about how Jesus had already warned us. About how they, the world hates him. Because he speaks the truth. And that because of that. We, he, they will also hate us. Because their fathers already did it to the prophets. Did it to him. And now they are also doing it to us. So that's just what came into my mind. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm I, really enjoying what is going on. Uh, I just want to address what you've been saying. The, also the brethren in here. The, uh, remember the Canelis story? I think it's uh, Canelis in, in Act 10 or 11. Act of the 10. Yeah. Act of the 10, yeah. So even though we knew he was a devout man, he gave alms to or he prayed several times. Uh, by his acts alone, he was righteous. You know, but that, that was not enough to save him. With all of that, salvation was still, he didn't have salvation still, you know. So uh, this only, um, it only betrays what, you, what you've been saying. That if we just don't preach to uh, other religions. We also preach even amongst the Christians, the, um, the denominations. There's a whole lot that needs to be demystified by the, uh, by the, uh, by the mystery of, of the Holy Spirit. You know, I just wanted to chip in that. It is very important you know, that, we, that we do the work that we are doing, Ambassador of Christ. Thank, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. That's, that That's is right. excellent. That is true. Cornelius represents the Gentile world. And a man that actually was so devout. In fact, do you know that Cornelius' level of righteousness at that time to proceed <laughs> the level of righteousness today in any local church? Because he was a man that fast and prays every time. It's so much that it is during the process of his fasting and prayer that an angel appeared unto him. But you know, angels may refer to you. Somebody who will speak to you. The word of his life for the angels are not permitted to preach the gospel. Do you know that? Peter wrote to us. He said these things, the angels desire to look into it. That's the privilege we have. We are custodians of the gospel to preach what angels can't preach. Angels were sent. An angel was sent to Colinius to refer him to Peter. Go and call Peter. He's living in the house of Tana, far away in Joppa. And Colinius called one of his devoted soldiers and said, go and do this job for me. We will not sit down until, until we get Peter here. And of course, when Peter came, the gospel was demonstrated. While he was preaching his long sermon, the Holy Ghost came down, right? And, this, and these Gentiles were saved. It is by the same token that we preach today to see result. Why is our society saturated with so many denominations? It's as dark as it used to be when the entire civilization was worshipping idols. Why? It is because the denomination does not translate to righteousness. There is a missing link. If every church, local churches, if every local church has this tremendous transformation from the priest to the members. If there is this transformation in everybody's life, the Bible says we are the salt of the earth, right? We are supposed to be the light of the world. So people will go to church on Sunday and on Monday they will forge receipts and on Monday they will manipulate the business and on, mon and on Monday they will steal and pay fair and they will take bribe. Where is now the righteousness? Where is the power to live a godly life? Are we just going and dance now in Christmas and give God praise and give thanks. Is that all? There is much more than that. Character transformation.
transformation, a change in the heart. That's what Yuani was giving an example. His cousins, oh, I believe in God, I believe in God. But the day God changed Yuani's life, he began to present the gospel that has changed his life. And suddenly, the people who were supposed to say, thank God, this is what has happened to us, they began to throw stones. <laughs> He began to say, no, this is too hard. Oh, you will weary yourself out of this. <laughs> but they didn't know that that is a lie. God wanted to fix that broken line of conversation between himself and us so that we can host him. Hence, the scripture tells us much later, our body, the temple of the Holy Ghost. When your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, that means you are practically carrying the Holy Ghost everywhere you go. That means you don't need to travel and buy a, a, a direct ticket to Jerusalem to go and listen to God by the willing world. You don't need that. God is a spirit. <laughs> and those that worship him, we worship him in spirit and in truth. That is what we get when the message of the gospel is preached to the Gentiles. Now let's go back to this story. Acts chapter 14. We are learning how defiant we must be in presenting the gospel. In staying true to the gospel. I tell you a story. Here in this country, a few years ago, we met a man, a great priest in his 70s. But this man has been leading many people in the largest denomination of this country. As a priest, as a priest, many people have been coming to him for counseling, you know. Supposedly, he's occupying a position that's supposed to lead people to heaven. But do you know himself was bound in sin for decades. He himself was bound in iniquity for decades. And yes, he's the one leading people. The Bible says if the blind leads the blind, what will happen to them? The disaster. They fall into the same thing. And here comes, you can imagine the many things, scores and hundreds of persons that have actually passed by this man. And yet, he occupying a priest's office in a big nation with big influence does not have a direct communication line between God and himself. And is leading people. Woe betide the members of his family. And then something happened. The power of God was introduced into his family <laughs> by signs. The man was about to die. And the power of God brought him back to life. And he invited us and said, Wow, all these years I have never seen miracles. I saw one by myself because my barrier was already been defeated. I heard you people pray for me and I came back to life. That is serious. But do you know, even though he tasted of the miracle, he was not willing to leave the darkness. Imagine that. So much that somebody else also had an introduction into the supernatural power that the true gospel of Christ brings by being delivered from the powers of darkness with the evidence of casting out devils. And when the man got that information, you know what he said? He said, don't believe that. He said, because demons are from Africa. Imagine that. <laughs> you only had demons from Africa. Before I came, did you see people to being tormented by demons? <laughs> Hey, all the demons that Jesus was casting out, where did they come from? <laughs> Lord have mercy. You can imagine how people in darkness have decided to create a gospel that will make them comfortable in darkness and keep other people comfortable in darkness. They are here to pull the sword of the spirit and shatter all of those dark comforts that leads to eternal damnation and makes people eyes open. Do you know it was just like the story of the man that was formerly lame and then the man began to walk. And then they were asking him, by what authority? He said, somebody preached to me and said, the name, measure the name of Jesus as you rise up and walk. The Pharisee said, don't, don't, don't give, don't mention that name. Give God raise. <laughs> the man said, well, I don't know about that. Well, I was lame before, now I am walking. What about the man that was blind? And they were asking the mother, by what authority did this man see? The mother, the parents were afraid because they would cast them out of the synagogue. Oh, they said, well, the man is of age. Ask him, ask him. And so they asked the man. The man asked, they answered them. Have I not told you before that a man called Jesus opened my eyes. I know I was blind. Are you to tell me that now I can see? I can see myself. <laughs> what else do you want? I was the blind man sitting down as a beggar. Now my eyes can see and you are querying me about my size. My friend, do you want to be Jesus' disciple? He said, God forbid. <laughs> what happens? The man who has tasted of the power of the world to come presents the gospel in his own way. He had no theology. Just, just encountering the power that removed blindness. He presented that gospel to the Pharisees and they revolted. They were caught to their heart. That's what happened. Today, there are many pastors and priests who are in sin, who are busy manipulating their church members, who are busy collecting seed and tithe and seed and offering and then without giving them the word of life because they themselves don't have it. They are still bound to pornography. They are still bound to alcohol. They are still bound to cigarette. They are still bound to every iniquity, fornication, adultery. They are still bound. They are still bound to spiritual 
prophetism, they still consult oracle. They still go into the spirit world to look for power. And yet they still mention Jesus. How will God manifest himself in such an assembly? That's why we preach not only to sinners, but also to people that claim that they are saved. Do not carry it about or carry it away with statistics. Oh, there are 200 million Christians in this place. My friend, it's not true. <laughs> Abraham prayed for 10 righteous people. God saw three and a half. That is always a statistic. That is, it has not changed. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes back, will he find faith on earth? Will he? Will he find faith? That's why we are compared hell to preach if we have experienced this thing and if we have not fully entered into this experience tonight is yet another night <laughs> when the door of salvation is open you can plunge into him and you will see the mighty arm of our savior pulling you out of the dungeon of sin into his marvelous light and the power of resurrection will enter into your spirit and you will realize all bondages of addiction is broken and you can walk out free for the first time for you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free you are you can see that yes continuing from this chapter 14 where we have read and from the stories you just mentioned from john chapter 9 where that blind man who has been blind his whole life now was preaching the gospel as he as he knew it has experienced it to the jews to the rulers when we, when we read from verse 9 verse 1 from this chapter 14 it was said that mm, they went both together in the synagogue of jews and so spake what is the soul speaking well the uh, chapter uh, verse 3 is telling us long time therefore about they speaking boldly in the lord when we have experienced the gospel our speak changes it is so, uh, and so speak they, they make speaks boldly there's such a boldness in the speech just like this blind man blind man is not very bold blind man cannot be bold because if, if, if he tries to, off, if he offends even to other people, when he's going by his sticks and he offers someone, the person just can trip the person and he's onto his face. He has no defense. He cannot be bold or he will suffer great. But when this man had experienced power, he was so bold. His parents were saying that they were afraid and said that just as the man, as the man, he's of age because they were fearing that they will be put out of the synagogue. But this bold man, now, now before blind man, now bold man, breathed that do you why are you asking me again that man that blind man was uh facing opposing the whole sentence all whole those rulers there who had been true they not just three years bachelor's degree not just master's degree not just phd of theology their whole life from childhood every day scripture 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 this blind man challenges the whole council and said why are you asking me again do you want to be his disciples that boldness is evidence that that you have heard the gospel. That boldness is what happens to us. It's stirring by the Holy Spirit within us. Just like when Stephanus was taken in front of whole country of Sandra and he was preaching from Abraham and on, on but, and concluding that the end was so glorious. His face was shining the whole time. That end, as he was saying that, that you, you were given the law by the angel, this possession of it, and you have not kept it. Boldness is an effect of true gospel that is in you, what you have received. And when that boldness is shown for people are astonished. People, just like Andrew was mentioning the story of this old man who was priest, big, big priest in the denomination. It is impossible for that man to have boldness because he has seen. When Adam had sinned, he didn't have any boldness to go before God because he knew he had just the leaves, fix leaves around him. He's not in the glory reel. But when we are completely pure and clean and filled with the Holy Spirit, his glory is indwelling us all around. We can go before people and declare to their face that you have crucified the Lord of glory by wicked hands you have done it. And they will be cut to the heart because they see. Actually, when if we speak the gospel like, hey, uh, sorry, I would like you to hear that God is pretty good I, I think so the people you are listening to they don't believe be, they say that poor man this is man isn't even believing what he's, he's saying himself he's just being brainwashed to, and he's some part of some religion and he just needs to do and share these things but when you are so bold that the foundations of the people they are believing or is shaken by just you speaking so boldly by the spirit of God that is what we have given not because our strength not because our ability but because of the spirit of God he makes us Bold, yes, Thank you very much. 
you know, just to add to what Yuani was saying. One day, I met two young men from the U.S. who came to Finland as missionaries of the Mormon group, the Church of Latter Day Saints. In the cold weather, and they were in with their with their jacket and everything and their bare badge and uh, their regalia, and they tried to begin to preach to me, and they were trying to preach to me Jesus. And I know this one is not correct because the message was not resonating with this with the with the temple of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> And then I listened to a point. Then I began to ask them a few questions. And I began to ask them a few questions. And the questions appeared to be deflating all their theology. And they were finding it difficult to answer the question. And it's about the Christ they have just told me about. So if really you know him, you should be able to know some things about him. Is that not correct? <laughs> How dare you preach somebody you don't know? And it got to a point when they could not survive. They opened their bag and brought out their weapons. They brought out their, their booklet, their Mormon book and everything. They said, let's read this together. I said, no, you don't need this. <laughs> if you know Jesus, it doesn't, you don't need to go and verify something. You don't need to find a way where you are going to answer one question. And then I began to preach to them about salvation. I said, my friend, you might be ignorantly following this thing that you came all the way from America to come and preach to Finnish people. You might not know that you're in the wrong direction. But traveling in the wrong direction for 70 years does not make it right. But you can make it right today because meeting me <laughs> is your opportunity to enter into the civilization of righteousness. Oh, when they saw that, that instead of them preaching, I am not the one preaching, they grabbed one another and ran away. <laughs> I tell you the truth. So they chose to remain in darkness. Why? Because when you have the gospel, you are bold. When you have the gospel, it is not you that is bold. The Holy Ghost in you. He has all of this power to convict the word of righteousness, of sin, and of judgment. He is the one. It's only that he has to speak through your mouth. That's why you have to be pure. That's why you have to be ready at all times. That's why, you know, sometimes even when we are not even sure that what we are saying actually makes sense. Maybe like, like you know, few, few, few weeks ago, we we're speaking to someone in the U.S. and in, in, in a large scientific conference. It doesn't look as if such a person was going to give his life to Jesus. So there was no need to even pursue that. But just to introduce that well we belong to god and we can't do anything about god you know and i said well thank you nice talking with you bye bye the young man said no can you pray for me i said i should pray for you are you sure he said yes i said that means you want to give your life to jesus he said yes i said well we can do it now people were passing up and down and the young man began to pray right there and he gave his life to jesus and few days later he sent a testimony he said thank god i opened the door to god in my life and that prayer worked because something happened change. That is it. We don't know what we carry. Now you are in your place of work. How many people have you introduced the gospel to? It is impossible for you to be a custodian of this supernatural power. I tell you, this is the only power that resides on earth created by God that cannot be manipulated by the ingenuity of any man. This is the only power. This is the only power. The only source of power that changes life, that continues to exist because someone paid the utmost price for it. And if you you, are, you have colleagues at work, you have neighbors, you have friends, and you cannot tell them. You have family members who are living in sin, and you cannot tell them because of what you think you want to gain. Because you want to gain their happiness. And you say, oh, you are too judgmental. My friend, the Holy Ghost will convict the word of judgment. Oh, you are too hard. My friend, the way of the cross is narrow. There is a broad way. It accommodates everything and anything. But it leads to destruction. There is a narrow way. Only few find it. It leads to righteousness. What were you saved for? Why are you in the kingdom? Oh, the apostle said in verse 3, Acts chapter 14. He said, long time, therefore, abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord. You know, they didn't run away. They stayed there. Are you afraid of your job? Nobody, nobody's going to sack you because greater is he that be with you than he that be in the world. When people come, depending on the kind of work you do, your client, your patient, whatever, do you try to find a way to, to bring them to the reality of the glory that you have inside of you? Do you know it will be a disaster? That at the end of time, when you get to heaven, you see your patient in hellfire and they pass through you. And you never one day, one day, you never one day show them the path of 
of righteousness. You see people, your client, they come around. Can you help me fix this? If you're a mechanic in the workshop, can you help me run this program? Can you help me you know, change this? And these people, they come to you for natural things and you provide help to them and you never open your mouth to preach Jesus. Why? You no, know, I remember somebody was telling us a few years ago in this country of a, of a young man that belongs to one of the local churches and he has a business. And I said, why does he not preach? He said, because he does not want to lose income. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? So you gain all the money of these people. They pass through you and they go to hell. What kind, what kind of civilization is this one? Paul the apostle said, long time therefore above day speaking boldly in the law. It is impossible for you to have this experience and your mouth is shut up. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach. You know, many people have now formed different kind of statement that makes them come down to disobey God. They are in disobedience and yet they are happy. Statement like nobody is perfect. We are all sinners. My friend, we are not all sinners. We are not all sinners. They are sinners themselves because they are addicted to sin. And the Bible says, ye are of your father the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. He does not abide in the truth. If you belong to Christ, you can't be a liar. All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. So how are we all sinners when I don't tell a lie? How are we all sinners? You speak about yourself. I speak about my Savior. I speak about the cross. You speak about your, your father. He's the devil. That's what the Bible says. Ye are of your father the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. We have found a way to make ourselves comfortable in disobedience. In this country, you hear religion is personal. Don't talk about religion with anybody. It is personal. Is that not true, Johanny? <laughs> Religion is personal. My friend, religion is not personal. Because the same person, if he's driving his car and his car breaks down, he will call you for help. Why is his car not personal? Why is his problem not personal? If his house is on fire, does he call for help? Why is it not personal? Meanwhile, there is a greater fire that is burning. It is the fire of eternal damnation. The Bible says hell enlarges itself. We don't know if the enlargement of hell fire, because hell fire is down below, if the enlargement of hell fire is responsible for all of this volcanic eruption and earthquake everywhere, we don't no, but hell is enlarging itself and people are running down into hell and yet you say they should not call for help what is the meaning of that if they don't know that is hell you tell them that is hell don't keep quiet don't keep quiet and god has helped us to do that and we are seeing many attorney many attorney many attorney in different nations turning from darkness to light and they say i never know i never know there was a man we met a doctor a big doctor here in this country and as we were as we began to speak about the message of life he was shocked how where do we come from from, to present such kind of thing to him. And he told us, he said, he is a practical person. This Jesus that you are talking about, how can he help me? Because of course, he's wealthy, he's rich, he's a great guy, he's intelligent, and he's very, 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 very practical man. He said, how can this Jesus you are speaking about help me now? And then the Holy Ghost gave us an answer. And after the Holy Ghost gave, up, gave us an answer, that answer knocked away all of his remaining bulletproof. <laughs> and the man said, now I need you to pray with me. I said, really? <laughs> said yes so let's pray and he gave his life to jesus as soon as we said amen he began to laugh uncontrollably unprovoked the joy of the lord feed his heart that is the experience what if we have not gone what if we also settled in our comfortable armchair of spiritual disobedience by saying well if i just live my life as a christian people will see me the way i live my life and then they will become a christian you are a liar <laughs> jesus would have said that in matthew 28 he wouldn't have said go and preach the gospel he wouldn't have said, go and be a witness. You know, he calls us witnesses, right? When you invite a witness to the court, is it a deaf and dumb you invite as a witness? A witness is someone who has the ability to speak and declare what his eyes have seen. If such a person is invalid, disabled in speaking, he cannot be a proper witness. We have to call for somebody else. The gospel needs witness. And witnesses are people with living experience. And so if you have not experienced the power of the gospel, fortunately, you can preach it. It doesn't matter if you have PhD in theology, it really doesn't matter. That is a certificate that is physical. We are talking of transformation in the heart, in character, in life. That is where the seat of the power lies. You can only give what you have. You only you can speak of. Yes, is it the office we are working in? Is it uh, we are in school? What place where we are in? If the people we meet, like now we are returning from this winter season, this Christmas season, people people are spending. Do we just return at home? How how was your day? Did you have a nice nice holiday? Did you enjoy the time with your family? Did you eat? Well, is 
makes your tummy full still. Do you need to have a diet because you ate so much chocolate? Or are we saying that, hello, now how was your time? And have you turned from your sin? Have you given your life to Christ? That what we speak about, it always just like the, just Christ and repentance just comes in. Because if we speak truly saying, if we speak like that, if we met people again, just like after this holiday, they are greeting us, hello, hello, how are you doing? How was your holiday? We're saying, yes, yes, fine, thank you. How was you? And have you repented from your sin? Have you changed from path that goes to destruction, to hell, to path of eternity? If they see that we are so serious with this thing, it's much easier for them to believe because if just like Holy Spirit speaks through our mouth, if we don't open our mind and declare, declare the truth to them, how can they believe? And if we believe the truth, if it is truth, which is indeed it is, we should be bold about it because it's much more severe. It's much more dangerous thing that way there. Imagine now we are everyone probably inside somehow some building. Imagine just if you would go out from your front door or if you have window in, um, close to you, that there is a pool outside there, even though it's winter in Finland, doesn't matter. Let's imagine there's a huge pool. It's full of oil and it's on fire. Imagine thousands and thousands of liters of oil in flame. Uh, th that amount of fire would like rise maybe 10, like many meters up, maybe three meters, four meters up. And the heat will be unbearable even close. Now imagine you see a man from the front door going up. Or, or let's imagine a child going out and one step out of time closing the pool. You know that soon you will hear a scream so terrible to you, yes, that you you cannot re uh, get out of it over here for the rest of your life. And you, if you don't do something, the child is going to enter into that inferno and die. People are not just going there. They are going to that pool and be there in torment for eternity for their sins. If we believe this, let's be bold and tell them there is Jesus who saves. You have deserved that in its place from the devil and his angels and you are going there by every Every step you live your life. But Jesus came and died for your sins that you don't need to go there. Just repent from that way where you are closing because you are working that very moment that way because that is the way of unrepentance. Turn away and turn to Christ. If we speak such to the people every time, maybe even every time we meet them. Hello, how are you doing? Have you turned to Christ? Truly. I mean this, I mean this truly. If we speak like this to them, they will first time maybe see that we are actually serious what we mean. That we actually believe what we preach. That actually if there is a hell that is enlarging himself, that is so terrible that the, this uh, rich man who died in the story of Luke 16 we're telling about Lazarus, a rich man. If it is so terrible a place that the rich man who has, by the way, enjoyed his whole life of so delicious, those wines, those new clothing. If that is so terrible a place that this man who had enjoyed so much as for one drop of water, how terrible is hell? The people are going to her. And we know it. Or actually, do we see it how it really is? Because it can be that there is like a cover in, in over our heart that it's like we hear these things, we see it speak about hell, but it seems like we just don't grasp it, that we haven't seen the pool of fire where people are just walking in and burning even when they're closing, they, their skin is starting to burn just when they're closing. If we see hell how it is, if we see how heaven is then good, if we see how the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ run from his hands, from his feet, from his side. When we see these things, when they are true to us, we make every effort, every conversation, every time, seizing our words with salt by grace that they could be saved. Let's change our speed. Let's enter into atmosphere of a mode of boldness to tell them that there is Jesus that saves. There is hell to shun and heaven to enter into. Are you willing this time Okay, not okay, or not now. Okay, but next time I will ask you again because you need to make the decision. That is a way we for we to speak to. Let's be that people who actually believe this book and speak as this is true. Mm. Yes, I'm glory be. Bad has that's a chapter for me. There is a line there, verse three, the, the later part of it. Look at what he says. He said that after the disciples stayed where they needed to stay to declare the word of God boldly, he said something. He said they spoke boldly in the law. They didn't speak boldly. 
boldly in their degree. They didn't speak boldly in their life. Everything they've acquired in the flesh, they died. You know, Paul the Apostle said, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisee. I studied under Gamaliel. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. You know, he has the citizenship of Israel as well as the Roman citizen. He didn't speak on the behalf of all of those physical accumulations. Those were not his basis for preaching and declaring the whole counsel of God. So his boldness was only in the law. So our boldness is not in our ability to speak or we have nice linguistics. We have have nice words we have a way of making people laugh no no those things we don't we are not bold in those, those are things that can be learned physically there are people who are even much, much better than us in all of those things but there is only one thing to be bold about the righteous are as bold as a lion why because their boldness is in the lord and the reason why they are bold in the lord is because the lord is always in confrontation with the kingdom of darkness jesus said if i come and cast out devil then the kingdom has come to you by the finger of God. That is why we are bold only in the Lord. We are not bold in our denomination. I say, don't you know, I am part of the group that is the largest congregation in the world that has the largest cathedral. Those are nonsense. We are not bold in that. We are bold in the Lord because it was that Lord that died. It was that Lord that was buried. It was that Lord that went to hell and received the keys of hell and death. It was that Lord that rose from the dead. It was that Lord that was glorified and now see it on the right hand of the Father. It is that Lord that everything is subject unto. He has all power and it is that Lord who has delegated that power to the church. For that reason we are bold because he said I give unto you the keys of the kingdom. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. The Lord is speaking. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and ye everlasting doors be ye lifted up that the King of glory may come in. And then the question was asked. A question, an ancient question was asked. Who is that no. <laughs> oh, the enemy want to know, why are you so bold? You are an ambassador of which country? An heavenly kingdom. That is what our boldness is dependent upon. We are not bold in the fact that, oh, this is my age. I think I should have the ability and maturity to, to discuss this thing. No. Oh, I have a lot of experience. I have been here for many years. That is not sufficient. You must find a way to be bold in the law. You must be bold in the law. And here it tells us, speaking boldly in the law. Now, that gave them an advantage. Look at it. The Lord now gave testimony unto the word of his grace. It was not their own word. We beheld him full of grace and what and truth. The word they speak, they were words of eternal life. This word was from the Father through the Son. He gave, Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, God in sundry times spoke to us by prophet, but now he now speaks to us by his own Son. That's why it's called the word of life. And the word I speak to you is spirit and truth. And so these men were bold in the Lord, repeating everything the Lord has said. It was not their word, it was his word. God putting his word in their mouth. And what happened? When you quote back the same word of resurrection, the same word of power, you are to expect the same signs and the same wonders. Look at that in verse 3. He said, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted what? Signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Look at that. These were mortal men. These were people like you and myself. Why do we think that the church lacks signs and wonders? We are not preaching the word of his grace. That is why. That's why there is a lot of manipulation Oh, I need to prophesy your phone number. That's nonsense. I need to prophesy your ATM card number. That's nonsense. We are talking of the word of grace that changes life. The signs and wonders that makes people to say, now this life I must live. The lie that is free from, like I've told you, the signs and wonders that brought somebody, uh, brought somebody out of a demonic bondage of more than 30 years. A demonic bondage of oppression, of mental problem, of evil, satanic. Satanic, satanic terrorism. When the person was introduced to the gospel, when the person was introduced to the message of life, in a moment, the chains were broken. The person fell to the ground. Here in this nation, began to meander like a snake. And the Holy Spirit rose and drove out those devils. And the person got on her knees and raised her hand in the sky in tears and began to worship God. What are we talking about? We are talking about the power, signs, and wonders. God, in his name, in his name, in his name. In days where we didn't 
not know anything about anybody. Just talking about Jesus, just talking about himself. And suddenly, somebody sitting down listening began to shake, began to shake. I'll say, what is going on? He says, some demons are talking to me and we can hear the voice of a man talking through the, through the, through the mouth of a woman. I say, don't reveal me here. Don't reveal me here. I say, ah, so Satan, you are hiding somewhere in the name of Jesus. Come out of there. And this, and that spirit came out. And the person got down and knelt down and praised the name of the Lord. Signs and wonder. When we are bold in the Lord and we testify of his name, why he came, why he came, why he came. To sever that bondage with Satan. To sever, to break that chain and create a communication line between God and man. If that is what we preach, we should expect the Lord, the Lord, the Lord to, to, to bring to pass. To give testimony to the word of grace. So it will not be surprised when, because of the preaching of the gospel, you lay your hands upon the sea and they recover. It will not be surprised when, in preaching the gospel, somebody brings in a dead person and you say, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Ra! And the dead comes back to life. The Lord will give testimony to the word of his grace by the demonstration of signs and wonders. That's why we preach. Let's preach this gospel as we are coming into the new year. Year. This year has gone. If we have not preached the gospel, if we never had any convert, we have wasted the year. If we are walking in a place and we never told anybody about Jesus, we have lied. We never told anyone about Jesus. Then we have wasted the year. And who knows if those people are still alive. But you know what? There was a tree that was planted that was so green but had no fruit. And there was an announcement from glory. They cut it down. Cut it down. And they said, one more year. Give it one more year. The Holy Ghost is giving somebody here one more year. To do the biddings of God. I speak by the Spirit. <laughs> the Spirit of the living God has been calling your attention. You have been giving excuses. The Holy Ghost is saying, one more year. One more year. One more year. Lest your candlestick is taken away from you. One more year. <laughs> God wants to use you to work signs and wonders. Why are you hesitating? It is not about your name. It is about his name. It is not about your reputation. It is about his reputation. Oh, don't be afraid. What if nothing happens? My friend, that means you are going on your own behalf. <laughs> if you are going on the behalf of the Lord, something must definitely happen. It happened in the heart of the apostle. It happened in this present generation. It will happen in your own life. You will be able to testify of the workings of the power of God. That is why we pray. Grace is the mystery of godliness. It is highly controversial. God became flesh. God was justified in the spirit. God was seen of the angels. God was preached to the Gentiles. He was believed on in this world and he was risen to glory. The Holy Ghost is recruiting us for next year, 2024. 2024. And the Holy Ghost is saying, go and find your microphone. <laughs> Go and find your amplifier. That's why we are not deaf and dumb. He has given us a voice. <laughs> One more year. Declare boldly in the Lord, in the synagogue, and also on the streets. In the congregation, in the local church, and also to sinners outside. Declare. In the stadium, declare. Anywhere in the marketplace, declare. In the office, declare. To your fellow staff, declare. Do not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. No one will set his eyes to do you any harm. We want to depopulate hell and populate heaven. We want to plunder hell and populate heaven. It is our goal, 2024. God is counting upon you. He did not say, ye are a royal priesthood. did not say, ye are a peculiar people. did not say that ye are right nation? Are you not expected to be zealous unto good works? To show forth his praise? Why? Are you excited? Let's close our eyes and pray. <laughs> Word of God has come to us. Lift up your voice anywhere you are. <laughs> if you have heard the message and you are guilty of this one thing, return. Return to the master. I repent. I say, Lord, every day, every week, every month counts. I must do something for the fordrance of the kingdom. I don't just want to be an unprofitable servant, entertaining myself with the affairs of this life, or just living and working and gathering money to pay rent, and that is all. I want to labor for the kingdom. I want to bring people to the understanding of this light of the gospel of Christ. I want to have Children in glory, pray and say, Lord, use me, hey, use me, use me, use me. I turn away from every excuse I have made in the past year. I turn away from every fear of men, from every fear of circumstance, from every fear of people. I turn away, I turn to God. 
begin to pray and say, Lord, here am I. Oh, that men and women will release themselves out of their fear and run into the arms of the Savior. Tonight is such a night to understand we God to stand our feet and make a declaration. There is a way. There is a way. A way of peace has been negotiated. God had come to fix the communication line that was severed by Adam and Eve. God had come. He had visited us. He wants to host us. He wants us to host him. He wants to be an abiding kind of glory upon our bodily temple. And he has brought us this far to present this, 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 this God kind of free liberty scholarship to many, as many as the Lord our God shall I call. Why are you keeping quiet? Turn to the Lord and make a promise. I say 2024 will be a better year. A year to declare the counsel of God on the basis of the power that you have encountered yourself. A time to declare you will not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the only power of God to salvation. And this is such a moment. This is such a, an hour that God is looking for righteous men and righteous women that we expand the frontiers of righteousness righteousness in their coast, that we diminish the kingdom of darkness and reduce everything darkness is trying to force us and compel us to do, that the light of the glorious gospel may shine. No man has a candlestick and hides it under the bushel, but he puts it upon the candlestick so that everyone in the house may have light. You are the salt of the earth. A city, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Why are you hiding yourself among the droves and the trashes of life. Come out and make a declaration on the basis of the Lord. You have gotten the message. God is recruiting ambassadors. God is recruiting high commissioners that we go out and make a declaration of the kingdom of life, the mystery of godliness, and pronounce Jesus saves, Jesus heals, Jesus delivers. He died, he rose again for our justification. This is why we preach. Be bold in the Lord. Be bold in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong. Pray and say, Lord, help. We need the help of the master. And if we have produced fruit this year, the father says, I request more fruit in the new year. The Bible says, whosoever produce more fruit, the father purges that he might bring forth more fruit. God is about fruit bearing. Fruit bearing that abides. Fruit bearing that stays. God wants to make people disciples. He said, go in toward the war preach and then teach and then teach and make disciples. And that's what God is doing through us. He has been successful with us in 2023, 2024. It's more year of more discipleship, expanding the frontiers, accumulating more disciples, spending time in bringing people to this light that they may disciple others also. The things that you have heard from us come me down to faithful men that we teach others also. There is a transgenerational transfer of the message of life. Don't be too busy with the affairs of this life. Let the light of God enter into your spirit and then make a commitment and say you will pray and you will preach. You will pray and you will preach. You will pray and you will preach. And you will be able to say in December if Jesus Christ tarries, is coming. Oh, thank God I preach. Yeah, my Resort. These are the children that have come to the knowledge of the truth. These are the backsliders that were restored. These were the sinners that became saints because I made the declaration of the counsel of God. I must present Jesus in my workplace. I not religion, not religion, not religion, but Christ, the Christ that saves, the Christ that delivers, the Christ that rescues. Pray and tell the Lord, Oh Lord, help! Oh Lord, help! Oh Lord, help! And if you are still walking in darkness, there is an opportunity to make things right. I say, Lord, let the blood that was, that, that, that was shed on the cross, that eternal blood, let it wash me. Wash me, O lamp of God, O, blood, o, o lamp of God, wash me from sin. Hey, pray and tell the Lord to wash you from disobedience, to wash you from rebellion, to wash you from pride, to wash you from arrogance, to wash you from spiritual comfortability. Ah! God will not leave you out of your armchair. You have to get up yourself and go. The Holy Ghost is calling. 
The Holy Ghost is calling. The Holy Ghost is calling. God is calling battalions, men and women, rise and declare me among the Gentiles. This gospel must be preached. This gospel must be preached. The Bible says, and then, and then to everyone, and then shall the end come. The reason why Jesus has delayed his coming is because the gospel has not been preached. Theology has been circulated. People are traveling front and back and, and talking about what their denomination believes. That is not the gospel. It is not theology. It is gospel. The gospel is different. The gospel has power. The gospel is one that produces salvation. The gospel has not been preached in all of this world. That's why Jesus Christ has delayed his coming. God is saying, get me more ambassadors that will make a declaration of the gospel of Christ. And every man, every woman, every family member heard that they are terrorists spiritually, either they are serving idols, either they are in sin, either they are abominable, they are in, in polygamy, either they are in polyandry, either whatsoever, either they are gay. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Preach. 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 And the Lord we see to it that it confirms what you are saying with signs. Don't be afraid of anybody's face. Don't be afraid of the faces of those who are visiting the shrine. For greater is he that be with you than he that be with them. Be not afraid. Preach the gospel. Make a commitment. Go to your in-laws and outlaws. Go to your cousins and our brother. Go to everyone everywhere. Declare. Tell them sin brings disaster and damnation. There is a hell to shun. There is an heaven to gain. There is a savior to call upon. Preach. 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 Do not live to please men. Live to please God. Live to please God. Live to please God. Leave to please God. God is calling you. Come out of the civilization of spiritual lethargy. Come out of the civilization of spiritual lukewarmness. Jesus said, you think that you are, you think that you are alive because you have riches, you have money, you have, you have influence. He said, no, I reckon that you are dead. He said, come out, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, and I will be a father unto you. He said, return back to your first work. He said, repent, lest I come and take away your candlestick from you. Jesus Christ is expecting us to produce fruit. He wants to be, he wants us to be proof producer. He wants us to be fruit producer and he will walk with us and confirm everything that we preach with signs and wonders. Keep on praying until you enter into the civilization of this truth that Jesus Christ has purchased by his own blood. The only access to God. The only pathway to eternal life. The only pathway to eternal joy. The only pathway to eternal liberation. Do not settle with the comfortability of disobedience. Do not settle with those people who are going nowhere. Who have found a way to make themselves comfortable in sin. God hates sin. No matter how little. No matter how small. God hates iniquity. And his eyes cannot behold any iniquity. Turn out of every Every form of sin and iniquity break out of every bondage bondage to social media that waste your time bondage to all the affairs of this life that waste your time bondage to all the pride of life the lust of the eyes and do something for the kingdom pray and preach pray and preach pray and preach the holy ghost is calling god is recruiting men and women in africa in asia in europe everywhere everywhere in australia in oceania god is He's recruiting people and he's saying, come, come, come and declare the whole counsel of God. It is to the will of God that we can turn many sons to glory. And the Bible says, as many as turn many to righteousness, they shall shine as the brightness of the stars forever. God has a plan for you. And part of it is that you shine forever and ever in his presence. You can say, oh, look at my children in the spirit. I brought to the faith. I brought to the kingdom. Look at those through whom God raised, raised, raised a generation generation of righteousness. Oh, do not compromise. Henceforth, lead a godly life. Make a commitment. Separate. 
Falia Ruska, Yenemante Lezefra Mitekotefali Muska, Rivontera, Lihore Montenebre, in the spirit and the Holy Ghost, we break every barrier, every barrier, every fear of man will be broken from your from your from your heart. The Holy Ghost, we break, we break, we break every intimidation, every fear of the righteous heart, everything that makes you to make a decision and you don't follow through on it to serve the Lord and yet you decline everything that is standing as an opposition to you declaring the counsel of God begin to address those things is it a background is it because some something happened to you from your childhood and that thing has it become a nemesis to your life today you can receive deliverance but because God is compelled to prove to you that when you preach the gospel there will be signs and wonders if anyone here is in bondage is in any form of affliction as a result of the vicissitudes of life. I come to announce to you the freedom that Jesus Christ brings. He brings deliverance. He brings liberation. And right where you are, the power of the Almighty God will touch you. And the yokes will be broken. And you'll be liberated. You will come out of that control. That control. That control that the enemy has tried to prepare for you, suffocating you in the night, giving you some mental torture, and makes you to be a shadow of yourself. And your belief system is always compromised. God we repair, we repair, we repair. That's why he came. He came as the manufacturer to fix everything that is broken down. Everything broken down in your mind. Everything broken down about you. Everything broken down in your psychology. Everything broken down in your mental capacity. Everything broken down as a result of loss, as a result of, of torment, as a result of wickedness, as a result of evil introduced to you years ago. Anything that has been broken down, the gospel can repair it. The power of the gospel can fix it. The power of the gospel can fix it. You can fix it yourself. You can't fix it yourself. The manufacturer will do the job. The manufacturer will do the job. Your customization has to be because you have met the Lord. Do not put your trust on the things that you have accumulated as a result of your exposure, as a result of what you try to do by yourself. There is a greater dimension. Satan needs to know you. Satan needs to say this about you. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. And then he mentions your name. Satan needs to identify you. Why? Because you are not walking by the rudiment of the things that your hands have been able to accomplish. But you are walking on the basis of the things that the Lord of glory had accomplished. Oh, that is for somebody tonight. God, we repair, we repair, we repair everything broken down in your life that has become a nemesis of your being. He will fix you up tonight by signs, by wonders, by signs, by wonders. And you will know you didn't come here by accident. But the Almighty God Himself had you in mind. He had you in mind. He had you in mind. And that yoke shall be broken. And I command by the anointing, by the anointing of the Holy Ghost, left every button, every button, every button on your shoulder be lifted. <laughs> For it shall come to pass in that day. <laughs> ah, shall the button be taken away from off your neck? And the yoke shall be broken because of the anointing. When the gospel is preached, the true gospel, are you addicted? Are you addicted to pornography? Are you addicted to all of these ungodly books? Are you addicted to things that causes you to be defiled? Are you addicted to things that invite evil spirits to come and be doing nonsense with you? Today, I break the power of addiction because the gospel has power to set people free and free completely. Be free. Whosoever Jesus Christ set free is free indeed. Change your garment. Change your wardrobe. Change all those things that you have accumulated and be righteous and stand for righteousness. <laughs> Clear up all the ungodly things. Do not give Satan any permission in your life anymore. Stay put with God and you will realize you are free. You are free. You are free. You are free. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, we are praying. Johanny, you can pray for us. Thank you, Father, that by the blood of Jesus, like the phone light to heaven has been fixed. That makes our voice to be heard in heaven. We are connected to God, but also God is connected to us. And through that divine light, God is speaking and will speak boldly through us, to sinners, to pluck them out of hell and populate them, to pull them out of fire and bring them to salvation, to the living world. It is that divine light, it is that power, that boldness 
voice in the law that truly speak to, that it's not our word, it's the word of his grace that we speak to people, then that word of God shall cut asunder, dividing even soul and spirit, and discerning his thoughts and purposes of the heart, and so shall the people enter into kingdom, because the sword shall cut even through their own heart. It is the sword of the spirit. Lord, you have spoken us through your word that they were bold, spoke boldly in the Lord, in the Lord, and so we speak boldly in the Lord. We don't care what people think, we won't care what people answer, we won't care if we lose our reputation, because it's not our reputation to lose, everything is laid upon Jesus. If there's a wicked reach because of Jesus, if there is a frontal, like if there's some anything or other thing, that is for Jesus. All the glory and all the shame goes to Jesus, but our position is to open our mouth wide so he can feel it. It's our position to speak boldly in the Lord, and it's his mission to confide and give a testimony of the word of his grace. Thank you, Lord. As we prayed at the beginning, that you speak to us, you boldly declare your counsel to us, so that we do your beatings and souls to say, indeed you did, and we give glory to you, because you did by your spirit, Holy Spirit, wonderful job. We give you praise. Thank you, Lord, our God. Amen. Amen. In the name of Jesus, we are praying.